So I've given a couple of presentations recently to to uh, congressional uh, members about PTSD and opiate use uh, disorder, and so I sort of compile those into this talk today. And uh, you know, the idea of, in terms of going there is to really talk to them and, and try and generate some interest in how can we resolve some of these issues, a lot of the issues that, that uh, Dr. Lee he alluded to. So when I talk to people, especially people you know in Washington D.C. or other places, I often start off with this, you know, why should you care? Uh, slide, and I think you know it's especially important for congressional members to think about this in terms of, uh, of public health and what's going across, you know, on across the United States. And if you look at this map, you know, and obviously you're some, a lot of you are familiar with this. It really, you know, it doesn't really matter where you're from, which state you're from, which state you represent. You know, it's it's legal in some form or fashion in almost every state. There's really only about four states left. And and I was actually uh, raised in Oklahoma, and even Oklahoma uh, approved medical marijuana last June. I think it's up for recreational this, uh, you know, like on uh, next week, right? So, so it clearly it's, it's a uh, national issue. And, and the truth is too, even if, you know, even in those states where it's not legal, I mean, there, there are patients in those states who are still using cannabis for a variety of reasons. And I also, you know, kind of highlight for people, you know, why it's important and it's, you know, people who have an opiate use disorder, obviously people are using cannabis to try and, and self-treat people with chronic pain, cancer patients, um, children with seizure disorders, Parkinson's patients, veterans for a variety of reasons. So, you know, this is an, an issue that is a very important public health issue. And as you can see from Dr. Lee's talk, it's, it's obviously been difficult to, to push the needle, right? It's, to make progress has been difficult. So why is it such an important public health issue? Well, this was also alluded to by Dr. Lee. Where do people, where do they get their information, right? Typically, if they go to their doctor and they say, hey, I mean, I'm thinking about using cannabis to treat you know, my pain, the doctors will kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, I'm not sure what to tell you. The research hasn't been done. So where do people get their information? So um, just for you know, fun, I typed in marijuana and PTSD treatment in Google, right? So if you're, if you're a veteran and you want to know about PTSD and marijuana as a treatment, you type this into Google. And so you know, what are the top three hits? Well, it's you know, marijuanadoctors.com psychology today and hightimes.com right those are the top three hits where people are getting some of their information and, and this is a big issue people you know the education piece knowing what you're doing you know knowing not to take um, eight puffs before you decide <laughs> you've had too much those, those are some very basic things that people don't people don't know right the difference between CBD and THC and, and how to balance that out a lot of things um, you know we, we need a better way of disseminating information you know, not necessarily through, um, and nothing against HighTimes.com or Psychology Today, but there's a better way to do that probably. <clears throat> so for the last 50 years, the, the real question that, you know, that the scientists have been addressing for the most part is, you know, how, how is can all the different ways that cannabis is bad for you, right? And I think the important thing to do and what, we, what we've been doing, and, you know, many of us is sort of reframing that question. It's not just about how is it bad for you, it's about, okay, what are the risks and side effects? or the potential benefits, right? So, and because every patient, if, when they ask their doctor about how to treat their pain, that's what they're doing. They want to weigh the risks and benefits, right? That's, that's how it's supposed to work. So that's really, I think, how we need to sort of reframe the research question uh, going forward. And just to sort of give you kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about today, it's kind of a brief talk, but I'll talk for a couple of minutes about our history, you know, what we did in the past uh, in terms of approaching this question, and then our more recent research on risks and benefits, and then also talk some about the obstacles to research. So for me personally, you know, um, we did some early work on cannabis back in 2007. We did the whole DEA thing. We got our license. We actually had people uh, smoking joints, night provided joints in our lab on, on main campus, right? Believe it or not, 2007. And the, the big problem was everybody was like, this is disgusting. Like, what are you giving me, right? And it's because those people were all used to medical cannabis, right? And then this stuff from NIDA, um, I, I think this is true, and Dr. Lee can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last time they grew was 2014. I don't know if you know. Yeah, so they, they grew, they, they're basically, it's not NIDA's fault. The DEA doesn't let them grow, or they, the DEA says when they can grow and when they can't grow. And so they grew last in 2014, they grew a bunch of stuff, they packed it in a steel drum, sealed it up, and that's where the black, the black goo, <laughs> the black goo comes from the 2014 <laughs> cannabis, right? And so, you know, our, our marijuana cigarettes were like 3% potency, and um, and they were probably, you know, a couple, it was probably a couple of years old. Anyway, didn't work out so so well for us. And I thought, okay, we're not doing this again. This was this was a big, you know, big waste of time. 
But then, obviously, Colorado legalized. We had families moving here with children, with seizures. And, um, you know, there was this sort of contradiction uh, in my mind, and I think in, in many other people's mind, about, you know, here we have people, kids taking some form of cannabis, and then we have this um, old school way of looking at it, you know, that destroys your brain, takes points off your IQ, the sort of traditional way of looking at it. So obviously a contradiction there. And so I think that at that point we really took a step back and said, hey, you know, we, maybe we don't know so much about this. We need to rethink our assumptions. We need to start over. And so we started looking at some of the data on cannabis in the brain and published a study in the Journal of Neuroscience in 2014 comparing uh, non-marijuana users to marijuana users just to see if some of this, you know, old school sort of thinking held up in terms of uh, fresh analyses. We very carefully masked these people in terms of alcohol use and we uh, compared the morphological data that we collected through MRI and found no differences either in the adults or the adolescents in terms of brain morphology. And we, you know, the, the literature definitely suggests there might be some differences with morphology. So we went back and we looked at all those older, well not all of them, we looked at a number of older studies. We calculated the effect size for different areas of the brain. And when you average all those effect size, what you find is basically something close to zero, right? And what happens oftentimes in the, the Im imaging literature is that people will find a, a difference, right? So maybe cannabis users have a smaller hippocampus than non-users, right? The next study comes along and finds something in a different part of the brain, say the cerebellum, right? And they don't comment on the hippocampus. And the next study comes around and finds one in the orbital cortex. And they're like, we found a difference, but they don't comment on the previous two studies. Th the point is there's a, a bit of a confirmation bias there in the literature. And we also followed up with that with a much bigger study we're talking about um, 1,336 individuals in this Cannabis in the Brain study that we published in 2017. Um, a number of these people were using at least once or more a week. So we were able to look at both the effects of cannabis while controlling for the effects of alcohol and vice versa, right? So this is kind of interesting to compare the effects of alcohol versus the effects of cannabis on brain morphology. When you do that, if you're looking at just the effects of alcohol, what you see here in the blue is are areas where alcohol has a um, deleterious effect on gray matter, right? And so you can see alcohol is a pretty pervasive deleterious effect. When you look at cannabis and control for a person's alcohol use, we found no effect of cannabis in terms of brain morphology. So pervasive effect of alcohol, which we, we knew was gonna be there because it's consistent with literature and no effect for cannabis. That's in adults. If you look at adolescents, well, sorry, actually I'll show you white matter first. Same scenario, pervasive effect of alcohol, not so much of an effect for cannabis. When we look at adolescents, we find no effect either with alcohol or cannabis. Not too surprising because obviously with adolescents, they haven't had the degree of exposure that adults have had. With white matter, some effect of alcohol uh, in adolescents and no effect of cannabis. So this issue of, you know, is it bad for your brain in a morphological sense? Um, the, the, you know, the data, if you look at the big data sets, um, not, there's not really evidence for that. And uh, I should mention too, one of my grad students did a, a study, her dissertation actually, looking at older adults, which nobody's looked at, right? So she was basically looking at adults over the age of 60 <laughs> who've been smoking regularly for 20 plus years, did the same comparison and also found no effects, right, in terms of brain morphology. That doesn't mean there's no effects on cognition, of course, and that's, we know that there are effects on cognition. It's just um, not necessarily effect on brain morphology. So, um, you know, those studies, I think it's important to take those earlier studies with a grain of salt when you're thinking about the, the side effects or negative effects of cannabis more generally. Okay, so I already alluded to this growing public health challenge. You know, we really need to sort of, we decided a few years we have to, re, we have to really reboot, right? We need to start over, find some way to, to look at important issues like potency and dose and cannabinoid and terpene profiles, type of product, you know, whether it's a, an edible or, or whether you're inhaling it or whether it's a topical. And then, you know, really to do some research to speak to the risks and benefits and, uh, and how those may be different in medical versus recreational users. So of course the, the issue is there's the traditional route, um, which is difficult, right? And then, and then we were thinking, is there some way, sure there must be some way, we can look at the products that people are actually using, right? So not using the NIDA uh, cannabis or GW Pharma, but looking at what's actually being used here in Colorado. So we, you know, we 
I naively thought, okay, well, we'll just put an IRB protocol in, you know, we'll be up and running in like a few months, right? And of course, the, the administration squashed that pretty quickly. Um, but they also came through in terms of uh, working with us to figure out a way about how to do this. And so there were maybe, you know, a couple of years of discussions, right, between the legal team and, and us and the administration here. And the really cool thing is that we did come up with a way that was um, consistent with federal law. And that's where this mobile cannabis pharmacology lab comes into play. So the idea was, you know, there's no way to really get around the fact that you can't bring people on campus and have them use cannabis, right, to study the effect. But there's no reason that we can't have a mobile lab that we take to the people, right? So the idea is that in this lab, we can do blood draws, we can do cognitive testing, we can do, you know, um, tests of motor behavior, we can do a lot of things in the mobile lab. And so that was the, the strategy that we, we sort of ran with. And so NIDA, you know, they, they basically agreed this was a, you know, a good way to, to go forward to look at what are people actually using in these states with state regulated markets, you know, we can look at that now with this uh, mobile approach. So the, the basic design here that cuts across a number of studies is we bring people in at time one or baseline, we do an assessment, a blood draw, so we're, we're able to look at exactly what's in the blood in terms of uh, cannabinoids. And then they basically either are randomly assigned to a product or they decide, depending on the, the study, uh, what product to use. And so in this first study, basically we were comparing a high potency flower to sort of medium potency flower. And, um, and also through a state grant that Cinnamon Bidwell has looking at high potency concentrate, 90% concentrate versus 70% concentrate. So able to compare concentrate and flower in terms of some of the potential side effects. So they get assigned to one of those. They use one of those for five days of ad lib use. On the last day, we basically set up a time to meet them. We drive the lab out to their house. They come down or come out to the lab. We draw their blood, we do a you know, battery of assessments, they go back in, they use the concentrate of the flower, then they come immediately back out to the lab, we draw the blood again, so we have an actual objective measure of how, you know, their exposure to THC and CBD or whatever we're looking at. And then we do our battery test again. So that's the basic design. And I'll show you some data from some of our preliminary results here. So this is the, uh, the slide looking at plasma concentrations. And so again, we have the four groups, 16%, 24%, 70%, 90% THC. And you can see that the plasma THC ranges all the way up that last data point to the top is you know, above 2,500 there. So very, some of them have very high blood levels. And just as a point of reference, in case and people need a point of reference, which I find fascinating, this, the legal limit, you know, the, you know, lots of states have adopted, many states have adopted five nanograms per mil as a limit, right? So, if, so we have 2,500 states have decided that five, five nanograms is the limit. So they, they are clearly, um, there's a wide range here in terms of how this works with, with across people. The high potency that the people doing the concentrates clearly have a higher blood level than the people doing the flower. So you might think for a second, I mean, just imagine this, right? You've got people who have basically twice the blood level, the concentrate users have twice the blood level looking at these data. You know, what would you expect in terms of the cognitive effects or the subjective effects of, of these products? I mean, think about that for a second, because we were a little bit surprised. This is the subjective effects, right? So big difference in blood levels, um, but no statistical differences in terms of how high people feel, right? They all seem to be titrating to a similar level of subjective intoxication. When we look at uh, cognitive effects, we definitely see that one of our um, most sensitive measures is verbal recall. And we have you know, a battery of five or six cognitive tests that we've taken from the NIH battery of cognitive tasks. This one seems to work the best and has been for a long time. People are clearly um, showing increase in verbal recall errors, right, um, immediately post-use, that persist to 90 minutes post-use. But again, no differences across the groups, right? So again, it seems like this, um, a difference between blood levels versus the, the actual effects. Now, um, we also are very interested in what does CBD do to this equation, right? If you add CBD to the mix, if people are using different strains, THC only, CBD plus THC, CBD only, how does that work? Um, the idea being that CBD probably mitigates some of the effects of THC on cognition, and we're getting some, um, we published one paper already, but now also getting some early results back from this study suggesting that, in fact, um, CBD, does, CBD does mitigate some of those cognitive effects. 
So that's kind of a, a look in terms of our, what we're doing now with, with more recreational users. We're also transitioning now to doing more work with medical users. And so what are some of the, you know, how, did, how are the risks different in medical users? So most of the work to date in the U.S. has been done with, with recreational users. You know, medical populations, they look at this as a side effect, right? So again, you know, the Parkinson's patient, the cancer patient, they don't want to be high. You know, they don't want, they, you know, cancer patients will come in and talk about, you know, I, I was doing Rick Simpson oil, but I'm high all day long. I can't get to my appointments. Well, that's not good, right? People don't like that. So, so this is an important issue, but from a slightly different perspective. And so what's interesting about this is that Sativex, which is another product that GW Pharma makes, which is one-to-one -one THC to CBD plant derived, has been um, approved in Canada since 2005 and also approved in many parts of Europe. So this is kind of the map of where it's approved in Europe. So the point here is there's a lot of experience already out there with a medication that's one-to-one, -one, right, THC to CBD. And if you look at the adverse effects, so they've done all their phase three trials, you know, they went through their versions of the FDA, they've done phase four stuff, surveillance stuff, looking at side effects and negative effects. The most common, and we're talking here about, you know, for example, one study, 941 patients, 954 days of use, mean dose of almost 15 milligrams of THC. Most common side effects were dizziness and fatigue, which typically went away after the first couple of days, right? So no evidence of abuse, reliability, or diversion, no evidence of short-term or long-term cognitive effects. So it seems like, you know, that, that it's relatively, if you look at those data, this one-to-one -one version is relatively safe. And just for fun, I put this, um, this I think I just find it fascinating, right? GW Pharma, it's been 100 years, and they're a billion-dollar company, right? And they're basically doing what Eli Lilly did back in 19, 1909, right? Yeah, so absolutely. not quite the same, but still, it's kind of fascinating. Okay, so in terms of risk, there's definitely some short-term adverse cognitive effects um, and some potential for misuse. CBD, we think that, you know, that may mitigate some of those negative effects, which is, um, you know, important information. And um, if you look at some of the side effects data, you know, it, it does seem like when you combine CBD and THC that you definitely see uh, fewer, fewer side effects. So what about the medical benefits? So we talked some about the risk, but what about the benefits? The National Academy of Sciences uh, formed a committee. I, mean, I was part of that committee back in 2016 to sort of form a compilation of what we know, what is the evidence about the, the benefits and the risks. And they found conclusive evidence for um, benefits in terms of chronic pain, chemotherapy-induced nausea, and MS spasticity, moderate evidence for sleep. They did not, we did not comment on epilepsy because the data weren't published and GW Pharma wasn't out yet with their Epidiolex data. And also, we, not, we didn't really comment on the opioid epidemics. So I just want to comment quickly on those two things. And so, um, cannabidiol and seizures, and I think in many ways, to me, this is kind of a cautionary tale here, right? Because what I find fascinating is that the FDA recently approved um, Epidiolex, or CBD for epilepsy. So we're talking like, what, 2018, yeah? And, but if you go and look at the literature, uh, you can go back to the 1970s, between 1973 and like 1980, there were a number of studies showing that CBD had some anti-seizure activity, right? There was a signal back in the 70s, right? So basically what we're talking about here is 2018 and 1973, so 45 years, right, to basically figure out that CBD might be good for people with intractable seizures. And so, you know, I don't know how, when I think about that, to me that's just a failure of the system. Like the people that sort of suffered all those years when, you know, we, somebody could have been pursuing this research. And of course, one of the reasons they weren't is because the obstacles, I mean, you can see even today, you know, from Dr. Lee's work, they have the obstacles to doing research with CBD, right? <laughs> it's a little crazy. So, okay, opiate epidemic, right? I mean, that's kind of the question now. We're dealing with a national opiate epidemic. And, and maybe some cannabinoid product can be helpful and maybe not, right? But we need to do the research. And if we don't, it's, it's basically a failure all over again. This is a super important issue. It's, you know, if you look at some of the evidence that's out there already, cross-sectional survey data, you know, not, this study that was published um, recently looking at a survey of 828 um, people, you know, 90, what, 7% say they're able to decrease opiate use with, uh, with some form of cannabis, right? Now, is that, you know, the, the kind of data you want to really recommend cannabis for opiate use? Probably not, but certainly it's an indication that something's going on there that maybe we should take a look at. When you look at the prescription data, there's been a number of studies now published looking at 
how prescriptions for opiates have changed in states with medical cannabis laws and or overdose mortality is different. And certainly there are some positive findings there suggesting some effect for, for cannabis and opiates. So the bottom line is there, you know, um, there is data to suggest that cannabis is effective, at least modestly effective for treatment of pain. And data suggests that people are already using cannabis um, to treat pain and to reduce opiate use. Prescription studies sort of back that up. And we think it's, it's really important now to do this uh, in a more systematic fashion to understand what role cannabis can play in terms of opiate use reduction. So on a similar kind of note, it's, it's an interesting story with, with uh, veterans and PTSD also. And so, you know, people are very interested in, in cannabis as a treatment for PTSD. It makes some sense when you think about it, right? We know from the National Academy report, there is some evidence that cannabis helps with sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance is a classic symptom of PTSD. Some evidence that helps with pain and opiate use, which is a, you know, a comorbid issue with these patients. Reduction anxiety, we don't know. Um, there's some interesting work coming out of uh, Michigan looking at how cannabis, in particular THC, may, may actually impact some of the mechanisms that underlie uh, PTSD. So definitely some hints there. And, and the fascinating thing here is that the American Legion has gotten involved and they have, they've done some work um, both in terms of advocating you know, their congressional members, but also in terms of doing some research where they did a survey of veterans showing that 92% of veterans supported medical research uh, 82% support legalizing medical cannabis. One in five veterans use marijuana to alleviate some, some me, you know, medical or physical condition. So the bottom line is it's clearly an important issue to, these, to this, you know, this group, and, and again, we need to know more about it. So just to kind of summarize up here, again, the question now is about weighing risks and benefits and, and also understanding specific formulations, right? So <coughs> Dr. Lee, he said, I want to know, you know, what is it that's driving the effects here? What is it, you know, how, how do these things work? That's what we need to know. But right now it looks like there's, you know, the risks in terms of brain morphology and cognition and abuse, especially for those products that contain some CBD, not so great. And the potential benefits, obviously, for pain, nausea, sleep, opiate use disorder, and PTSD, uh, obviously there can be some benefits there. So, so we have basically been trying to, uh, to run with this approach where we're looking at the effects of products that are available here in Colorado. And we, uh, you know, that, the work I showed you was kind of the, the first step. The next step was looking at the combination of THC and CBD, which we're doing right now and um, working on some analyses in a paper. But also, um, Dr. Bidwell has a cannabis and pain study and uh, she's uh, making uh, nice progress in terms of recruitment already. And also a cannabis and anxiety study funded by NIDA. We, um, we have a grant in that'll be resubmitted soon looking at effects of cannabis in lung cancer patients. Interestingly enough, we just found out that we have a cannabis and diabetes risk grant that just scored really well. Also a cannabis and opiate use grant that scored well. And, uh, and one of the things that's most fascinating to me that we really want to look at is cannabis in, in our aging population, right? So you may know this or maybe you don't, but the fastest growing demographic group is basically people over the age of 60 in terms of cannabis use. And we see this in some of our other studies. And, and you know, we're very curious about how, how is that unfolding and, you know, what are the risks and benefits in that particular population? Because that, that to me seems like a very much a, a, an area that has not been studied enough and one that has important implications for public health. So I think that's going to be an interesting piece of work to look at. And one last thing that occurred to me as I'm thinking about this morning, this slide that's kind of cool, is that, you know, look at the, in the, in the old days, basically NIDA was the only NIH agency that would fund this work, right? If it said marijuana, your grant automatically went to NIDA. It's in the abstract, it's in the title, it goes to NIDA. Well, we have thankfully, I think, been somewhat successful about getting other people to think about, you know, other NIH agencies to think about, you know, maybe they should be funding this work. So, we, as I talked, as I said, Cinnamon Bidwell, NCCIH, the uh, cancer grant, I mean, NCI, you know, is, would be the funding agency. Uh, for diabetes, NIDDK is going to be the funding agency. NIA for the aging grant. So, the, the kind of the, the interesting thing here is there's been a shift in terms of how. NIH sees these things, and I think they're beginning to understand their public health implications, right? And whether it's for, you know, diabetes risk or, or aging and cognition or, um, you know, or whatever. So that's a nice, uh, nice change to see. Okay, so, so yes, I mean, people are making some progress on this, but, but the reality is, you know, that the, the widespread acceptance of cannabis and, you know, kind of the anecdotal reports, the, you know, the CNN reports by 
Sanjay Gupta, that's, that's you know, really outpacing the research. Even in, it's going to take a long time to catch up, basically, right? So in essence, we've got the, uh, you know, the cannabis court in front of, cannabis cart in front of the marijuana horse, which is not ideal and something that we need to turn around. And certainly, I think there are people who are working hard on that. So, so what needs to change to facilitate that? We, uh, you know, when I've been to Congress recently, we've, there's been a lot of talk about safe harbor for universities to conduct research on products that are sold in state regulated, state regulated markets. And, um, you know, basically we, we need some, there needs to be something needs to happen to take it off the schedule, right? Ske being schedule one, even the CBD, it just makes it almost, I mean, it's not impossible, but it makes it very, very difficult. And so um, the other thing that's interesting is people aren't really talking about is what happens, because eventually that's going to happen, right? I mean, Canada has gone legal, you know, Mexico's working on it. When hopefully we get a change in administration, we're going to see some change in terms of this issue. And when it comes off the schedule, though, the next issue is going to be the FDA, right? And you heard um, Dr. Leahy again talk about the FDA decided people can't drive, even if, the, you know, their IB said they can drive, right, for, for CBD. So this, again, that's going to be the next hurdle, right? So we get past the first hurdle, then we got to deal with the next hurdle. Good to start thinking about that now. Okay, so I just want to um, end up here. I know I've got like 30 seconds left, right, Carol? <laughs> so, just the, the why, and I always end up with this because I think people just to, to sort of drive this home, why should you care? I mean, the reason why is because, you know, patients are counting on this information and they're not, we're not doing our job to get them this information right now. And it's not that we're not trying, right? It's just it's not happening probably fast enough. So, um, so again, I think it's important that we push this work forward. A lot of great people, you know, that we're uh, working on these projects. And I, I mentioned Cinnamon a couple of times, Angela Bryan. Um, some postdocs and our whole crew here have done a fantastic job sort of um, pushing this forward. And also, uh, you know, I want to say thank you to the people, you know, the administration who have helped us get this going. It's, uh, you know, that's like, you really need that support or else it's hard to get anywhere. So thank you very much for inviting me and um, happy to take questions now or later.